Welcome to Jubilee for the Earth, a podcast about biodiversity and our sacred story. My name is Wesley Cocazello, and I'm a member of the Justice, Peace, and Ecology team for the Missionary Society of St. Columban. The Columbans are a Catholic congregation of priests and laypeople who live in solidarity with those who are made poor and marginalized, including the wounded earth. We put this experience into dialogue with scripture, Catholic social teaching, and science, and this has compelled us to find ways to restore our relationships with God's creation. We believe that ethical behavior must no longer be confined to our relationship with God and other human beings, but must also include all of creation too. In his encyclical letter on the environment called Laudato Si, Pope Francis writes, it is remarkable how weak international political responses have been towards addressing our ecological crises. There are too many special interests, and economic interests easily end up trumping the common good and manipulating information so that their own plans will not be affected. Both the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis are accelerating rapidly, with scientists warning us that there's not much time left to act before the worst consequences are unavoidable. In the face of seemingly indifferent or callous political leadership, it's tempting for us to give up hope that meaningful solutions to our problems can be implemented. We ask ourselves, how can we move past an action? How can we create a healthy politics capable of prioritizing the common good? The solution is for each one of us to get more involved in politics. It's important to note that politics is not about politicians or political parties. What it is about is every member of a community coming together to build the kind of community they want to live in. Quoting the compendium of the social doctrine of the church, Pope Francis reminds us that in order to make society more human, more worthy of the human person, love and social life, that is political, economic, and cultural life, must be given renewed value, becoming the constant and highest norm for all activity. When we feel that God is calling us to intervene with others in these social dynamics, we should realize that that is a part of our spirituality, which is an exercise of charity, and as such, matures and sanctifies us. It is our responsibility, as much as it's our right, to use our moral voices to advocate alongside the earth and its more marginalized children for a more just and sustainable world. To solve the ecological crisis, we need every person to be a part of the solution, starting in their local community and moving all the way up to the highest levels of society and government. Episode 12, Creating Healthy Politics biodiversity loss, and advocacy for the common good. I wonder if you could begin by sharing with us some of your own personal faith story about you know, how you got involved in this work, how the role your faith plays, maybe even a special place or animal or creature in your own life that inspires you or your tradition. That was Amy Wola Machevaria. Amy is the International Justice, Peace, and Ecology Coordinator for the Missionary Society of St. Columban. She also serves as the co-coordinator of the Vatican COVID Commission Ecology Task Force. Amy is talking with Gopal Patel. Gopal has been a faith-based environmental advocate, campaigner, and consultant for over 10 years. He is the co-founder and director of Bhumi Global, a nonprofit organization that works to educate and mobilize Hindu communities globally for environmental action. Yeah, no, thank you. It's, I think it's, um, it is, it is a, a time where we don't know um, what to do sometimes, and we don't know what's happening. But I, I think there's also, there are parallels there with the world of faith, because sometimes we just have to put our hands up and say, God, I don't know anymore, help me. Mm. Right? And that's when the grace and the mercy comes and, um, and, and we're inspired to, to act in ways that maybe we hadn't thought about before. Um, and that was definitely my situation because I, I was a trainee Hindu monk for two years. Um, and maybe you didn't know that, Amy. So I didn't know that. Yeah. So um, I, I, I lived in a Hindu ashram in, in India for a year um, after my college days. I, I lived on the banks of the Ganges as a monk or trainee monk, as I like to say, for a year. And then I did another year in London in, an, in a Hindu ashram. An ashram is like a, is like a monastery, uh, mm -hmm. a Hindu ashram in, in London for a year as well. Um, and then as I came out of that world, because I realized being a monk wasn't for me, I was more interested in monkeying around than actually being a monk, uh, that um, 
I was like, I literally put my hands up in the air and I was like, what do I do next in my life? I had an undergraduate degree. I had a, I had a master's in, in the humanities and an opportunity came to me um, to work within the Hindu community globally on issues of climate change and sustainability. Um, and so I kind of took that as like a interim kind of bridging role. Um, and that was over 12 years ago. And now it's become my full-time career of working not just within the Hindu space, but it, with all people of faith and spirituality and wisdom traditions on issues of climate and, and biodiversity and so on. And, you know, over the years, so many things have um, inspired me and, and, and have grounded me and it have given me hope in this and given me direction. Um, but I think... Um, the thing that I keep coming back to, and I forget it, but when it comes back into my life, I realize, oh, this is, is actually, um, it may be a bit surprised to people, but it's actually um, a person called Henry David Thoreau and, and a place called Walden Pond. Um, oh. And actually, as we're talking right now, I'm actually in Boston visiting for a few days. And oh. um, Walden for me and Thoreau in his life and his message really for me speak very strongly about the intersection of um, spirituality and values and beliefs, but also people think he's only, he was only a hermit, that he, he stepped away from the world, but actually he was very strong in the um, movement to abolish slavery and, and in so many kind of activism spaces. And so for me, he's this perfect blend of knowing when to step back, but knowing when to step forward. Um, and I think that's something we all have to discern for ourselves is like, if we step back, why are we stepping back? And if we step forward, what is our contribution? And so for me, he's a constant source of inspiration and hope about how to live in this moment of, uh, of the climate crisis, of the biodiversity crisis. So he's someone, his message, his life really gives me a lot of hope, um, a lot of inspiration and grounding in this work. But the other thing, and we were, we were talking before the recording that gives me a lot of hope is just people like you, Amy, and, and your organization, the Columbans, and so many wonderful people across the world who are doing this work, who are committed. And I was in Glasgow for the climate conference, and it was great to see the energy inside the conference space. People were really trying to do their best. And it was great to see the activists outside as well, like, you know, protesting and telling us to do more. And so, like, the groundswell of enthusiasm, the groundswell of, like, urgency and people trying to do their best, both in formal negotiating space and outside in the public space is giving me a lot of hope that actually we're going in the right direction. So, uh, yeah, so th I think there's just a lot of hope to be found in the world right now when it comes to this work, if, if we're looking in the right places. Like, what, what are those spaces like? What does it mean to be inside um, a conference of parties, a UN, you know, process like that? And, yeah. and how? How, how can we participate? How do, how do we become involved? Sure, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And you know, I, I, I've only really been working in the UN space now for maybe five years or so. And before then I was interested, but I, I was like you're saying, not sure how to engage, why to engage, what's the value add, what can we offer? But, you know, we know as people of faith that, you know, we have a responsibility, a mandate, or whatever we want to call it, to, to speak to people and be out in the public space and, and to listen and to talk and, and to share what we have to share. And that means we have to do it in the churches and the synagogues and the temples, but it also means you have to do it in the, in the corridors of political power as well, of which COP, these UN spaces, is, is the premier corridor of power when it comes to climate change and, and biodiversity. And so, in those spaces, I think we all have to find a reason why we want to show up and what we want to contribute. And for me, when I was in Glasgow, as you said, it, it feels like a long time ago now, when I was in Glasgow, I was there to beat the drum for biodiversity. Because we know, when I say we, you and I, Amy, and I'm, I'm sure many of our listeners know as well, that the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis are intrinsically connected. Um, you know, I mean, because if, the, if we don't solve the biodiversity crisis, then the climate crisis has no hope and, and, and vice versa. They're both two things of the same track, so to speak. Um, and so it's vitally important that we're in those spaces, talking to people, raising awareness. And I think for me, I was in Glasgow many months ago now, talking about biodiversity, but also um, working with other faith-based organizations and individuals in that space, 
to talk about the values and the ethics and the belief systems that underpin our current society because we haven't got to this place when it comes to the environment by accident you know there have there have been specific um changes or uh, mindsets that have led to the world that we see it today both economically and politically but environmentally as well and we know that to shift things in the direction that it needs to go in there needs to be the money there needs to be the the policies and the frameworks and the technology but there needs to be a change in consciousness a change in hearts a change in values and I think we as the faith community, that's our value add. The scientists won't talk about values. The business people certainly won't talk about values. We can talk about values and ethics in a very, um, that's our home turf, so to speak. And so I think that's why it's important to engage in these spaces because no one else is going to speak to that. And in terms of how to engage with these different, as they're called processes, the COP, the COP process for biodiversity or the COP process for um, climate change, it is a bit daunting from the outset, but you know, once you start looking into it, it's actually quite easy. It's just about filling out some forms and submitting it to the relevant UN agency. There are no fees involved. You don't have to pay any money. Um, and very easily one can become a, a, an observer to these processes and one can attend these conferences and be at the table and put their views across and, and, and so on, which is something that Amy, that we're, that we're working on in relation to the CBD, which is coming up. And so there's a real need for us as people of faith to engage in these spaces, but there's a real opportunity and a real invitation that we should be in those spaces just as much as everybody else. And so um, I'm so grateful to be doing that work with you and everyone else that's working on this in a, in a, in from a perspective of faith and spirituality. That's great. I, you know, so many things that you said have sparked um, memories for me and I'm I'm remembering when I first moved to DC like two decades ago and I started I was getting involved in the advocacy work and I don't know it, there was some kind of frustration or block and you know U.S. Congress was not listening to you know the call for immigration reform or something and then I in a moment of prayer, I stopped and realized it's not about success. It's not about, that's not why I'm going. Mm. Uh, I mean, obviously you'd like to have an impact, but part of, I mean, largely it's just, how can I not? Like, that's the message, faithfulness to the message. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's yeah. God's work to open people's hearts. And, yeah. Um, that, if I can, that, that's really beautiful because I, I have the same mentality in, in, in the Hindu text, the Bhagavad Gita. It says that you have to do your duty, you have to do your responsible action, but you shouldn't be attached to the results of what happens. The results are not in your hand. You just have to do what you have to do as best as you can and leave the rest to God. Yeah. Um, and I, so I'm just resonating with what you're saying there. It's so important, yeah. Isn't that great how our traditions have so much in common yeah you know? yeah i love it um the other thing i was thinking about when when you were talking about how to get involved i was wondering about the possibility of people contacting their own national delegation or negotiators is that an effective way for people to kind of make their voices heard yeah, it's a good question. I haven't really thought about that approach before, um, but I think definitely because, you know, these treaties, these frameworks, these policies that, that the UN, people think the UN draw them up, but actually it, it are countries that draw these things up. The UN just facilitates the process, um, but every country has a team of negotiators, of, of delegates that draft these things and put forward the views of their respective countries. And so Definitely, like if we can find, you know, who the delegations are or the main people are in each of our governments that are going to be going to Kuming or other UN moments and will be speaking on behalf of us as, as Americans or Brits or wherever we are in wherever we are from in the world, we can certainly we can certainly make an impact to say, hey, look, we want this to be reflected as our country policy. Um, I think that is an, an effective approach. Yeah. Maybe we'll. Maybe we'll try some things. <laughs> yes.
Thank you for listening to Jubilee for the Earth, Biodiversity and Our Sacred Story. To learn more about the Missionary Society of St. Columban, and also how you can help care for our planet's biodiversity, please visit our website at columbanjpe.org backslash jubilee podcast. This podcast was produced by the Missionary Society of St. Columban. The theme music is from Purple Planet Music. All other credits are listed in the show notes. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you have, please consider leaving us a comment or a review. We'd love to hear from you.